is such a pleasure to be here today and to be working with uh, Mass TLC. I've known Tom for many, many years, and it's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to, um, uh, to work with him. Now, today I want to tell you about transportation and how um, in the future all of our lives uh, would be much, uh, much better in the car. Uh, if you came on uh, I-90 this morning, you know what I mean. Uh, we need that. Uh, but before I do that, I would just like to uh, tell you a few words about my organization. So for those of you who are not familiar with MIT, uh, MIT organizes itself into departments where all of our academic and educational work uh, takes place and laboratories. Uh, this is where all of our research takes place. Um, so I belong to CSAIL, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, uh, which is MIT's largest interde interdepartmental lab. Uh, we have about 1,000 members, of which 100 are principal investigators. We have about 500 uh, graduate students and a, a research budget of about 45 million. And we have a very distinguished uh, membership. Um, Two-thirds of our faculty are professional society fellows. A third are members of the National Academy of Engineering and Science. We have uh, six MacArthur Fellows, four Turing Awards. A uh, Turing Award is like the Nobel in Computer Science. And uh, we do research in all areas of computer science. Here's a summary of, um, of all the areas uh, we work in. And recently, over the past couple of years, uh, we have uh, began to articulate uh, uh, research themes and, strength, uh, and trends um, uh, that cut across multiple PIs and multiple uh, disciplines within computer science and outside. And um, we are currently uh, really uh, pushing the envelope on uh, these nine uh, areas, um, some of which are uh, present in today's uh, meeting. Um, so we're very interested in mobile and wireless. We think the future um, has, uh, has a lot to do with building the uh, wireless infrastructure of the future. We recently launched a new center on big data. Uh, we are very interested in cybersecurity. We have a, a group working in that uh, space. Uh, we are interested in uh, better understanding intelligence and how to, um, how to create smart worlds, uh, in uh, developing smarter tools for learning, uh, in, uh, in developing better robot systems that interact with people uh, in, and in uh, delivering uh, more intelligent and personalized uh, healthcare. So the topic I want to uh, talk to you about today sits in several of these uh, uh, cross-cutting programs and in particular uh, in big data and wireless. And this is about uh, transportation. Now, I became very passionate of, about transportation. My background, by the way, is in robotics. I became very passionate about transportation eight years ago when I moved to Boston from Hanover, New Hampshire, where my commute was about two minutes and the rush time was about five minutes. Um, so I have, uh, I have moved to Weston. I work in Cambridge. My commute is anywhere between 17 minutes on Sunday morning and an hour and a half uh, before uh, Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Something like that. So as I was driving back and forth um, uh, to work uh, eight years ago, I started thinking about when is, it, when is the, the road free? How can I really understand when I can beat everyone else and, uh, and, uh, and escape um, the, the congestion and the crowds? So transportation uh, is, uh, is personally very important to me, but also a crisis in the making uh, globally. Because the demand for urban mobility uh, is exploding globally, and it, it has become infeasible to keep expanding the physical infrastructure, the roads, the highways, um, uh, the parking um, areas. Uh, there are also growing concerns for, in, for the environmental impact of uh, transportation. And I just want to play a little video to you uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was recorded from, the TV, from TV about uh, a year ago in Los Angeles. And so let's listen. Here's the closure for a second. 405 North and South, gone. Shut down from the 10 to the 101. Sepulveda Boulevard, open, but not recommended, say Metro officials. Kirk Steenburgen, who works in the past, has a vision of what it will look like, which happens to be exactly what traffic experts predict. You can walk faster than you can drive. Here on Sepulveda. Oh, yeah. And not just here. Maybe you think you'll slip through one of the canyons to get between the valley and the west side. There's Beverly. Glen, Coldwater, even Laurel. Well, Metro does not recommend it because there's a pretty good chance those routes will be bumper to bumper all day long. That's what traffic managers recommend. Stay home. 
So stay home, uh, the solution to uh, urban transportation. So this was uh, recorded about a year ago in California when one of the major highways um, uh, was uh, going to be shut down for uh, repairs. Well, what happened, everybody stayed home and the traffic was brilliant um, that day. Uh, but uh, more seriously, our, um, uh, our time in, in traffic has uh, gone up significantly uh, over the past uh, 20 years. And here you can see, um, you can see the, uh, the increase from small to medium, large, and very large uh, urban areas. And uh, in blue, you see the, the congestion in 1982. And in uh, light blue, you see the congestion in um, 2010. So uh, for cities like ours, um, the, uh, the amount of time uh, we spend in congestion has gone up uh, a multiple fold. So what can we do about this? Well, I believe um, that the future urban mobility uh, will harness a combination of new technologies and optimized operation ma uh, management to maximize the productivity of existing infrastructure, to improve the level of services, and to enhance sustainability. And what kind of, uh, what kind of tools might we have available? Well, we have uh, our personal navigation devices, in-car devices, we have uh, uh, devices installed on the road network, we have wireless, um, we have uh, our, our phones, our smartphones. Um, all of these um, uh, sources are, are useful at collecting data about transportation now and transportation in the, in the past, pushing this data up in the cloud and, and giving us tools to better understand and forecast uh, what is happening uh, with our transportation system. Um, so, in my view, there are three ingredients um, to, uh, to delivering a more intelligent, more effective transportation system. First one is mobility on demand. Uh, the first one is at the intersection of intelligent transforma uh, transportation and information technologies. And the third one uh, is, uh, is moving forward um, with some way of, of um, adding economics uh, to the transportation system uh, by road pricing. So I imagine picking up the newspaper and just like we see the uh, weather forecast today, uh, we could see the transportation forecast for today uh, based on all the historical data that has been accumulated by the users of the transportation system by sensors uh, installed in the road network. And in addition to that, I envision um, uh, this, uh, this transportation forecast as providing personalized suggestions to people uh, that will enable them to really in, uh, improve the quality of life uh, uh, for the time spent uh, in the car. So what I want to do today is uh, tell you a few words about what each of these three um, topics mean to me. So we have began to see a paradigm uh, shift in transportation. So we see the zip cars, we have, see the one-way uh, one bike sharing uh, systems. We have a paradigm shift from um, infrastructure augmentation to new modes of um, personal uh, urban mobility. Now, um, how many of you have uh, used a zip car or a bike um, sharing system? Do, how many of you know what, uh, what these are? So, I'm, uh, so, so these are, there, since there are a few of you who haven't put your hands up, uh, these are, um, uh, uh, there are in, in the recent past, several companies emerged um, that um, uh, installed cars and, uh, and bikes in urban areas. Um, you, the way it works is you become a member of the organization and you can pick up one of those um, uh, vehicles at any point in time from a, a given uh, station and you could drop it off at any other station. With a zip car, you have to uh, drop the car off where you pick it up. Um, with bikes, you can drop them off any, any place you like. So for instance, in Barcelona, when they introduced the bike sharing system, Everybody loved to pick up bike, uh, bikes in, uh, in town, which is uphill. Uh, people rode the bikes downhill to the beach, spent a day enjoying and, um, and, and drinking, and then took buses or taxis up. So, uh, so the next day, all the, all the um, bikes were, um, were in one place. Same thing happened in Paris. Um, so what these cities had to do was hire uh, big trucks and, and, and people to go pick up the, the vehicles and rebalance them manually. And um, so while, um, while the system provides flexibility um, to people, there is also a cost uh, that was unexpected when, uh, when the systems were first uh, deployed. Now, 
However, even with this, uh, uh, even with this um, uh, disadvantage, uh, the, um, these shared uh, transportation systems have a key advantage, and that is moving from low utilization rates of our own uh, vehicles uh, to, to very high uh, usage of, uh, of the vehicle. So my car stays mostly in my garage at home and in my garage at work. It's on the road a very small fraction of the time. So what if other people could, um, could use my car? Uh, gingerly, because I love my car. Now, um, at the same time, uh, there is another paradigm uh, that has been uh, uh, evolving and improving significantly over the past five years, and this is driverless cars. Um, so Google has, um, has created a driverless car. You can see a picture over here. This car has uh, driven over 200,000 uh, miles in real traffic. And in fact, it inspired the state of Nevada to issue license plates for autonomous cars, for robot cars. So if you're in Nevada, you can get a red license plate that says your car is a robot. It drives itself. Now, imagine if, uh, if the bikes in Barcelona could ride themselves up the hill. Um, or if, uh, if the cars that um, uh, companies like um, cars to go in Europe um, could really um, uh, drive themselves to the location where they are needed, where people are waiting uh, for them. That would be fantastic. And this is the kind of, um, this is the kind of vision uh, that I am uh, I'm really excited about and I, uh, I, I really wish to see implemented. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm so excited about this vision I actually joined a, a program, uh, MIT started in uh, Singapore, uh, to create um, the future urban mobility um, uh, transportation system for Singapore. Um, and um, while in Singapore, we have developed um, an autonomous car. You can see it here. It's an electric car. It's a small golf cart that is um, augmented uh, with drive-by-wire, with sensors for the road network, and with intelligence. Uh, and that can uh, drive autonomously uh, not on, on mass bikes, so uh, we're not quite ready for that, but, on, uh, but certainly on the local um, Singapore campus. So what I would like to advocate uh, is um, one-way sharing um, uh, systems with uh, driverless cars as a way of solving the last mile problem. So will these devices take us all the way from, um, uh, from Weston to Cambridge? Probably not, or probably not right now. Um, but... Um, but suppose we all take public transportation, and suppose public transportation is, uh, is really um, enhanced so that it's uh, actually pleasant to, uh, uh, to ride uh, in, uh, in trains and, and buses. And, and um, when, we get off these, um, uh, the, when, when we get off our public transportation uh, means, we have a suite of, of cars ready to take us wherever we need to go, no waiting. And then we release the car, and the car automatically knows where the next person in queue is and drives itself to pick that person up and, and deliver that person to the destination. I think that would make uh, transportation and moving around uh, in cars fantastic. And uh, we are, um, we are it, it, it is the goal of our project in, uh, in Singapore, and um, uh, it is a goal that, um, in general, we would like to explore in any urban area, um, including our own um, city. So. The key challenge here is how do the cars, so there are two key challenges. How do the cars know to drive autonomously? And the other is how do the cars know where to go next, where the next passenger is? And how can we avoid the Barcelona problem where everybody goes to the beach and then forgets the cars there? Um, so there are, uh, so our, our group at MIT has been um, uh, thinking quite deeply about uh, these problems. And in fact, the good news is that we actually have computational solutions to many of these problems. And I just want to show you a little simulation here where um, you can imagine uh, these fixed spots as being um, locations uh, in the city where perhaps uh, there is a, a public transportation a stop or there is, um, or, um, uh, or, or it's, a, it's a car pickup spot. And in gray, you see empty cars, and in blue, you see uh, you see cars with people in them. People can go anywhere, uh, but, uh, but sometimes empty cars accumulate. Now, if the cars could drive themselves and if they, knew where, uh, and if they know where people are, uh, they could automatically rebalance. So uh, my point with showing you uh, this simulation is that actually the problem of, of getting these cars to go where people are is, is actually not that hard. So in theory, uh, we have some solutions. Of course, going from theory to practice is a huge step. 
So, uh, so this is part of the solution. The other part is, uh, is making um, or bringing, um, uh, creating vehicles that have what it takes to uh, drive people around or and, and then drive themselves to where they need to go next uh, and to do that in a, uh, a cost-effective way. Uh, DARPA had a, a, a huge um, and, and very exciting challenge a few years ago. The, uh, the, it was called the DARPA Urban Challenge where robot cars had to drive in, in real traffic um, for a large period of time, six, seven hours. And there were several groups, six I believe, um, uh, six research groups competed and completed this challenge. Lots of other groups entered. So there are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm and, uh, and momentum behind this idea. And we already have some proofs of concept uh, that robot cars are coming. Um, but the DARPA um, Urban Challenge cars had about a half a million dollars worth of equipment on board. So question is, how do you do it in a cost-effective way? How do, you do, how, how do you build an autonomous car uh, in, an, uh, uh, in, a cost, in an inexpensive way? Uh, our car is actually quite inexpensive. It only uses a couple of cameras and a couple of um, laser scanners, but, um, it, um, but the car needs uh, wireless, in, uh, wireless infrastructure uh, because with these two sensors, uh, the car cannot see absolutely everything on the road and every possible uh, road um, situation. So uh, what we have to do uh, is uh, install cameras on the road network and allow the cameras and the cars to talk to each other and share information. So for instance, uh, uh, we have our, our sensors point towards the right, but if there's, uh, if there's traffic coming from the left, then we need the road to, um, to tell us. So this is what our car looks like, and let me show you a little video that, um, that explains uh, to you how we use this car on the campus of Singapore. Um. Vehicle sharing systems have a potential to mitigate traffic jams and overcrowded parking. Ideally, these systems should allow one-way trips where the customers can return the vehicles to any station at any time. One of the main challenges in managing such systems is in keeping a balanced distribution of vehicles among different stations. A solution is to use autonomous vehicles. The main contribution of this work is the development of a low-cost autonomous vehicle platform to ensure economic feasibility. Our car uses three LiDARs one on the roof for static feature detection and map matching, one at waist height for obstacle detection, and one tilted downward for curb detection. The car is also equipped with a camera, an odometry system, and two computers. A customer can request a vehicle online or using a smartphone application. The request is processed by a central scheduler and assigned to one of the vehicles. The vehicle then drives towards the pickup location Navigation is based on an accurate map of the environment and predefined guiding paths for the vehicle to follow. The customer can follow the progress of the mission as well as the location of the car in real time. For vehicle localization, we avoid using expensive GPS units and instead employ a Monte Carlo-based approach to provide accurate localization. When there are enough features, map matching is performed using raw laser data. In other areas, the vehicle detects the curbs using the tilted laser and localizes itself by matching the observations with a curb map. As a result, the pose estimation particle cloud tends to elongate on long uniform stretches of roads, regrouping itself at intersections. At the pickup location, the customer presses a button after boarding to start the journey towards his destination. So, um, so what does it take be, uh, besides uh, autonomy to, uh, uh, to implement uh, such a system? Well, we would like to know where um, the customers are, and we would like to know where, um, what traffic uh, looks like historically and, in, uh, and um, uh, in, in real time right now. And one reason we have started uh, this project in Singapore is because there is a lot of data about transportation in Singapore. 
So every taxi cab in Singapore has, um, um, has an in-car device that records the tracks of the taxi every uh, few seconds. Uh, we have access to a fleet of taxis of, 20, uh, of, um, of size 26,000. And then every, uh, many of the roads in uh, Singapore are um, instrumented with uh, inductive loop detectors, and we have uh, access to the loop detector counts uh, in, um, uh, in uh, the whole of Singapore. So with access to, these, um, uh, to all this, uh, this data, uh, we can do a lot of things. Uh, we can really model traffic and traffic patterns globally uh, at, the, at the scale of an urban city, uh, in our case, Singapore. Not only that, we can figure out exactly how many probe devices do we need in order to monitor traffic at such a large scale. And it turns out you don't need 26,000. You need more on the order of a few hundred um, uh, devices. So think about having a few hundred instrumented devices in Boston, uh, taxis, buses, um, uh, whoever delivers the transportation. Uh, we could actually map uh, what traffic looks like uh, in, uh, in Boston at any point in time. Uh, moreover, using access to, um, uh, to the, the GPS data and to the loop detectors, uh, we can create models about the, that, that, uh, that capture the performance of every road segment. Uh, in, uh, in, in, and in real time, we can monitor uh, where in that uh, road segment um, uh, traffic, or, or where in this, um, in this graph uh, uh, traffic actually sits. So uh, what does that mean? The more cars you put on the road, uh, the slower um, traffic flows. And um, the, the traffic degrades, but eventually it hits a blockage point uh, beyond which the road um, just doesn't perform anymore. Uh, so uh, by using GP these GPS devices and loop detector uh, feedback, uh, we can find out where along this curve traffic is performing in real time. And if we knew that, <laughs> we would know which roads are in trouble, which roads to avoid, how to, um, how to redistribute uh, traffic. So um, in addition to that, uh, we, can, uh, we can do a lot of things. Uh, we can look at where all the people are and all the traffic is. We can, lose, uh, we can look at how weather affects traffic. We can look at how congestion affects our commute times. Uh, we can look at uh, how, so, uh, how special events impact traffic. Uh, we, could, we could look at environmental um, consequences of, uh, of uh, transportation. So um, I just want to show you a little bit about how this works for Singapore. shows how people come and go to Singapore and also how, um, how um, uh, packages uh, come and go through Singapore. Singapore is a, is a, um, uh, a shipping hub um, for the world. So all of these visualizations you have seen in, uh, in the movie I showed you before have uh, very significant data analytics uh, behind them that enable us to, view, to look at data uh, generated historically and in real time uh, from a handful of sensors and, and really give people a much better picture of, uh, of what uh, transportation looks like. We can further customize this picture. So uh, we, have, uh, we have tools that allow us to compute how long it takes for you to go home 
or to go to your next meeting at any point in, uh, of the day. And if you have, so for instance, uh, uh, taking this, um, uh, this route, uh, if you have to do it at 6 o'clock, it takes much longer than if you could switch your commute time uh, by a half an hour or, or, or 15 minutes. So all of these tools uh, can really help people uh, decide for themselves on how to use the road network and how to, how to navigate. Or uh, they can be fed into a, uh, into a global planning system that would allow people uh, to make um, uh, to be um, to be guided by the by the system uh, in such a way that uh, everybody benefits. So uh, instead of uh, optimizing for individual users, we can optimize for the entire throughput of the network. Um, and this is what is called um, achieving a social optimum in your system. Um, so here's an example where you can imagine several users uh, in a, in a system that share some of the road segments on their commute, but not the entire path, uh, we actually have tools that uh, enable us to guide the, uh, the vehicles along uh, different paths to ensure that the throughput in the system uh, is, as, uh, is, is optimized. Um, so what is the big deal about this? Well, we, know, we all know that uh, we like to do what we want to do, so, uh, so people don't, uh, don't like to be told um, uh, where to go. Uh, but we have done the following very interesting uh, study in, uh, in Singapore. So we have compared how our um, uh, traffic control system um, uh, fares against real ta taxi flow, a greedy assignment of flow, so that means um, assigning the best path to everyone, and uh, our system here. And what we have shown is that by controlling only 10% of these 26,000 taxis that are um, on the road, uh, in one day, uh, we save a year's worth of travel time uh, because everybody else uh, benefits. Every, everybody else's um, time is greatly enhanced. So maybe we cannot control individual cars, uh, but there are, um, there are um, uh, fleets and, uh, and other uh, transportation groups uh, that are much more amenable uh, to, uh, uh, to being controlled on how they want to drive than, um, uh, than individuals. So this is very promising and exciting. Um, uh, let's see. The other thing we can do uh, is uh, we can really consider the economics of transportation. Uh, so how many times was I late for a meeting stuck in traffic on the mass bike and, uh, and, and, and feeling like I would pay anything to be able to jump uh, at the front of the queue? Um, and uh, short of having a flying car, I, I cannot do that right now. But imagine introducing uh, dynamic pricing schemes in our, in our road segments uh, that take advantage of these graphs I showed you earlier, where in real time we can, we can see how the road network operates. And we can um, uh, then adjust the cost it takes to drive through the road network through different segments in the road network. So I think the future of transportation is really exciting. I think Boston is a fantastic place to imagine being the uh, building um, the, the future transportation systems. And uh, I'm, I'm, we are very excited to get behind uh, this idea. And uh, uh, in, in summary, I, I really believe that uh, the excitement uh, lies in, in three areas, in, in delivering mobility on demand for the last mile of our um, transportation problem. Uh, in, uh, in merging smart, intelligent transportation with um, information technologies, and in, um, uh, in uh, beginning to think about uh, dynamic road pricing uh, to bring uh, economics to transportation. Um, so with this, I will stop, and I'm happy to take questions. Ray Wright from Mastery. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. I um, wanted to ask you if you've thought about the behavioral aspects a little more. You didn't mention them, but it occurred to me a long time ago that, for example, uh, giving people information about when the next bus is coming, uh, which you did point out, um, is very helpful. And it's, not, it's, it's something that we've been able to do for, for, for many years, but it's not, it's not done very widely. Uh, so more people would use public transport if they could pull out their smartphone and say, oh, there's a train coming in 10 minutes, or there's a bus coming in five, I can leave the house now. Yes. So behavioural aspects. But the other point is, in terms of, um, in terms of driverless vehicles, is that 
you know, we're seeing more and more vehicles are become, could be, have the potential to become much more than just vehicles. We're already talking about maybe they store electricity overnight and you plug them back in and when, they, when, when you're not driving them, they can be part of the grid. Um, what, one of the things that occurred to me is if it took me an hour to get to work or two hours to get to work, I wouldn't necessarily mind if I, had, if I, if I wasn't driving the car, if I could you know, be on Skype and talking to my, my, my partners at work, or if I could be on the, uh, you know, watching the TV, if I could be reading a book. Um, I, just know, I just need to know when to get in the car and I could have a very pleasant experience. I wouldn't worry about how, what the traffic was like. And that's a, maybe a different view than thinking about pricing the road segments and making it more expensive to go on the, on the quicker routes. So I just thought I'd ask you if you could comment on that. Thank you. So these are great comments. Uh, uh, user behavior uh, is uh, very, very important uh, because any time you start thinking about uh, injecting any sort of control in the system or even doing things radically differently, uh, you, you really need the buy-in from, uh, from the users. And um, it's, um, so, but this actually requires uh, significant effort. Uh, so it, it, it requires that we actually uh, do some studies. Uh, in Singapore, we are, um, we are looking at uh, taxi driver behavior as, an, as a surrogate um, to user behavior. And in particular, uh, uh, Singapore changed their road pricing policy recently. And we have data from before and after. Um, so one of our current research topics is to see how the behavior of the, of the drivers uh, changed from before and after. But also, when I'm in Singapore, I, uh, I don't have a car. Uh, I, um, I, have, um, I, I ride in taxis all the time. I actually love it because uh, within three minutes I can get a car so I can get my own driver and um, I don't have to worry about parking. I don't have to worry about uh, directions. I don't have to worry about keeping to the, uh, to the left side of the road. So uh, there are many advantages. But I talk to taxi drivers and they tell me how they think about uh, all these questions. So these are the beginnings of our, our user studies. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, vehicular networks, and especially vehicular autonomous networks, uh, it is the dream. And um, in fact, we, um, uh, the robotics community had a big push in this, um, in this direction in the 80s um, by, uh, by a technique called platooning, where uh, you put a lot of cars together and then they all networked. But the technology was not quite ready in, in the 80s to deliver on that, but uh, the, today, uh, uh, since the 80s, we have made so much progress, uh, both in terms of in computation and in uh, networking and in, in so many other services that, uh, that we couldn't even imagine in the 80s. So I think it's, uh, um, it's, it's coming. Um, and absolutely, that is the vision. Uh, I also would like to say that there is a continuum between where cars are today and where, where we would hope to get with autonomous driverless cars, where increasingly more and more of your car uh, becomes automated. So cars already have um, safety sensors. Um, you, you already get um, the, the uh, navigation direction. So we already see some elements of automating um, uh, driving in today's cars. Hi, I think this is great and, and very, very promising. Um, I was just wondering, you talked about the research in Singapore, which you know, tends to be an orderly place. Have you looked at cities like Rome or Istanbul? Or <laughs> <laughs> that is a good place. We have not, um, we have not looked at uh, Rome yet, um, uh, though I have a lot of personal experience in Rome. Um, we, uh, we have been approached by urban planners in other uh, urban cities in Asia, uh, so uh, not quite orderly as, uh, as Singapore. So we have been approached um, uh, by um, urban planners in the Philippines and in China. And, uh, and uh, the urban planners view a lot of, see a lot of value um, to uh, just seeing the history of transportation. So just uh, historical pictures of what their flow looks like because then they can decide um, more adaptively, when to put buses and taxis in the system, where to put them. Um, so if they have a sense of where people are, where the demand is, and where people go, so where the, the assets end up, um, they, can, uh, they can organize uh, better transportation systems, even with the uh, manned resources that they've got available. 
politics, the user behavior, the technology, which of these should we expect in Boston first and when will it be here? So we have already began uh, discussions uh, with the transportation department um, and, um, and there's great enthusiasm uh, uh, with respect to uh, doing um, the historical models and with respect to showing where the assets are, showing where the buses are and uh, doing uh, route, routing recommendations. I think it will take um, a bit longer to get the autonomous vehicles uh, in, uh, in Boston, uh, but I see the convergence of IT and IT uh, coming together fast and really uh, uh, bringing the quality of our time spent in traffic um, uh, up.